Hello, my name is Dennis Kim. Um, I'm the concert master of your Pacific Symphony. And we have a very special guest today, uh, a legend uh, in the tuba world, in the music world. Uh, we have our principal tuba player, Jim Self, joining us today. Welcome, Jim. Nice to be with you all. Now, uh, for those uh, who could make it today, thank you. I know that we had a little uh, scheduling uh, conflict, but uh, this will be obviously online later, so uh, please share. And any of us, any of you here joining today, please, if you have questions for me or for for Jim or for Jim, please uh, feel free to put into the chat or the or the Q and A. Um, but uh, like like always, you know, we we start a little bit before um, the the start time to get to to just get the uh, you know the technical stuff out of the way. But Jim already told me like amazing stories in the last five minutes, so this is gonna be an amazing hour. Uh, first of all, Jim. Uh, how long have you been out here in California? 1974. So it's uh, 46, seven years now. Wow. And so before that, I heard you're from Pennsylvania. I'm originally from Pennsylvania. Uh, I went to college to be a band director in the Indiana University of Pennsylvania. And then I, I went into the U.S. Army Band in Washington for three years. Taught public school one year. And then I went on the road playing rock and roll and jazz and stuff playing bass, wow. and then I uh, I got a college job at the University of Tennessee for five years. Wow. And then I started, in right away, started coming out to USC to do a doctor's degree with Tommy Johnson, the great tuba player here. And uh, I never looked back. I didn't go back, you know. I mean, uh, I, I was making good money almost immediately, and uh, I gave up my college job and... Uh, and since I've had 40 some 45 years of studio work and orchestra work teaching and it's been a, a very fortunate career. Wow, it's incredible. I have a bunch of friends, uh, tuba playing friends, you know, ex colleagues of mine and uh, friends back east who are like, oh my gosh, Jim, Le Jim, he's a legend. My God, he's a he's an incredible uh, player and, and a great guy. And so I know a lot of those guys will be watching um, now. But uh, so, yeah, uh, tell me a little bit about how you started with the Pacific Symphony. I want to let you know that the you know what legend means, don't you? Uh, it means old. I I it's old. <laughs> no, nobody's a legend when they're young. Oh, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> Unless they die. Uh, that's true. Yeah. And hopefully, knock on wood, um, uh, I hope there's good health in your future. Um, but when did you start? Did you start with the Pacific Symphony right away? No, uh, Pacific, uh, I, I started in 1986, which was the year that the new, the old new concert hall opened. And uh, they had a tuba player they wanted to replace, I guess. And uh, I said, well, I'll come down. I live in LA, so the drive is a drag. But uh, I, uh, I said, I'll do it for principal pay, which they weren't paying before that. But of course now it's in a contract, but, but uh, they said yes, and I have spent 40 or 30 some years, seven years, something like that, 35 years there now. Wow, it's amazing. So obviously the orchestra is a little different than it was back then. Uh, what are some of the biggest differences? Well, uh, over the years we've had, we, you know, we didn't really have auditions in those days. Mm. It was pretty much word of mouth or the principal player would say hire this guy or something. Mm. And it was heavily studio musicians, you know. And then, of course, it started out with at Cal State Fullerton as a mm -hmm. kind of a student orchestra, really. And so some of the, the grandfathered musicians, and some are still in the orchestra, were students at, at Fullerton at the time. Mm -hmm. They're very fine musicians, of course. Uh, they've been there longer than me, if, and too. But, uh, but uh, well, you know, our, our trip to Europe was wonderful. Our trip to China was wonderful. Uh, Carnegie Hall, uh, I wish we did more of that. Uh, although as a busy studio musician, I didn't want to leave town very often. And uh, uh, Carl has been, a, a, to me, he's, he's, he's really been good for the orchestra. He's been around a long time, which sometimes that's not good with orchestras, but in his case, he's, He's really built something here, not just a, a fine orchestra, but he's gotten so much better himself as we all have, as a players and as conducting and so on. He, and uh, we, we, I really appreciate him. 
and uh, the, you know, I've, I, I, the whole thing is cool. <laughs> um, again, the new, hall, by the, way, the new hall is, 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 it's just one of the best in the world, I think. And I right, played well, absolutely. Yeah, the Sacred Storm Hall, I mean, the place that the Pacific Symphony calls home is, is an amazing uh, hall, incredible acoustics. And uh, no, first of all, it's beautiful inside and out. But um, so everyone knows you as the, the tuba player of all the movies that we've ever watched. Um, so, you know, to go through the discuss, uh, you know, all the movies is, is we don't have time for that. But uh, name some of your highlights, as, as, uh, as they would say. Well, I'll just I'll just make a, a preface to that. Uh... I have a website, jimself.com, easy to remember. And there's a page on there called articles page. And on that page is a lot of trivia and a lot of articles and things I've written and the memoirs, stuff like that, including a memoir of our trip to China and to uh, New York. And uh, uh, anyway, in that, there's, there's also a, 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 a page in there uh, that lists 300 movies of the 1500 I did that I oh gosh. that I thought had either tuba solos or, or really good scores, you know, not no. necessarily, you know, I certainly didn't have that many famous tuba solos or anything, but so if people can look that up, you know, it's, it's very hard for me to uh, pick them out when you've done that many, you know, and uh, uh, I've worked for John Williams for a long time and for James Newton Howard and, uh, and uh, principal for these guys and, and James Horner and, uh, and uh, John Debney and, uh, and quite a few others. And uh, most of their movies were really good, you know, and uh, those, are, those are the best of, of, our, of the world that we, I've lived in. Jerry Goldsmith, I worked a lot for him too. Oh, it's, it's amazing. I mean, I, I've just started because I, I just moved out recently, but being a part of The Last Star Wars with John Williams is, is I mean, it's, it's a dream come true, obviously, for someone who grew up watching Star Wars. And to, to think that you were on all those recordings of every movie that I've probably ever, ever seen. Uh, and, you know, he did the first nine or first six Star Wars in London. Right. So, and I was always mad at him. And that. I've never seen those films, in fact. <laughs> Because I was mad about it, you know, and but he had to do it because of the rules over there. But right. the same with Harry Potter. Pretty much all the rest of the stuff he did in L.A. or one or two he did in Boston. But right. and I worked on probably the majority of the films he did in the last. Uh, I became his principal player in 1990 with a movie called Home Alone. I think I've heard it, and uh, me and my kids have watched it a, a few times. Uh, well, it's back yeah. to the solos, and and I think that's why he hired me because I have a certain jazz influence in my playing, I guess, mm. and the solos are a little bit jazzy, and uh, it turned out that from then on I was his player from ninety on for for about uh, until two thousand fifteen, really, when the Star Wars came back. He changed all his principal brass then. Uh, us old guys got sort of pushed out, uh, but I agreed to play second tuba on some of the stuff to my mm -hmm. former student, Doug Tornquist, who is my number one sub in the symphony too, by the way. And uh, uh, so I worked on all three of them, the, the seven, eight, and nine, uh, as either as a second tuba or as a uh, uh, principal when Doug was uh, available or not available. So I know we have a bunch of clips, but uh, the one that's legendary for me uh, it's the Close Encounters, and, and hopefully we can put that up. And uh, uh, you told me that there's a story behind this one. It's a big story, yeah. Uh, number one, uh, the, there's, a, there's a section in the movie that's iconic. It's the it's the uh, con called the Conversation, and it's uh, it's a conversation between the Earth and the mothership, and uh, it was done as a what they call a pre-score. Which is very unusual. It was it was it was actually recorded before the movie was made. Wow! And they made the movie to fit this music that John wrote. And one day I get a call on June sixth, or the day before that, in uh, nineteen seventy six. To uh, I'd only been in town two years, and uh, Tommy Johnson was his tuba player. But Tommy was on one of the rare vacations of his life. He was in Hawaii, <laughs> and he couldn't get back for one day's work. And uh, so I said, yes, of course. And uh, I went into Warner Brothers and it was 
John and the engineer and, and, and Spielberg, and there were four musicians only. And when you hear this, it's a strange kind of piece of music that he constructed a lot of it right on the session. And uh, uh, the tuba is it's not a tuba. It's, I mean, it's not a tuba solo. Mm. It's tuba and contrabassoon in unison. Every, oh. every note. Wow. And, uh, and that's why it sounds a little electronic or mm -hmm. not real tuba-like, you know, some like muted tuba or oh. something uh, altered. And the, the, that we were the voice of the mothership and uh, the voice of the earth were two oboes in unison. Wow. And, uh, and you'll notice in the background, there are lights, a pink light, a blue light, you know, the famous ba 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 those five iconic notes mm -hmm. are, they're triggered. They, on the computer, they trigger a, like a pink light might be an A flat, you know what mm -hmm. I mean, of the, those five notes. And, uh, and, 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 when, and they tried to make another version of this after I did it with Tommy Johnson, really, and I'm sure it was well played, but they couldn't sync up the lights. Oh, I see. <laughs> so, they, so I saw John Williams at the Music Center one time, and he says, 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 I feel sorry for Tommy, but he says, we used your version of it. And I says, well, that's very cool, you know. Wow, and that's a cool story. That was one, of, I call it a studio story in the sense that, I just stumbled into that job. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then later on, uh, you know, 15 years later or so, uh, he hired me as his principal with Home Alone. And many- Oh, many an it's an awesome story. Uh, Alexi, if, if we can uh, uh, play that clip, it's amazing. amazing <laughs> um, and it makes more sense now that you said that there's a contrabassoon playing all along because no one would have guessed that it's amazing you can hear the contrabassoon now can't you definitely once you once you once somebody tells you this i mean right. i've been identified as a soloist by so many people the tuba players all over the world and everything else mm -hmm. but uh it's not there was a, a tuba uh, contrabassoon player uh, his name was uh um Oh, darn it. I'm getting old, man. I forget the name. So I'll think of it in a second. He was a tuba, uh, bassoon professor at USC. And uh, 
and there were two old boats also, all very no. important players around town. No, it's, and even the, the units in Oboe, I mean, now that you say it, it's, it's, it makes so much more sense. It's, and that's amazing that there, there's two Oboes that can play in unison like that. I mean, there's so many uh, uh, units in Oboe jokes and uh, that, uh, you know, that's amazing. Oh, really? I never haven't heard those, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I heard, first of all, congratulations. I heard you just got your second COVID shot. I did. And, and I no side effects? Not yet. It's been three days. And uh, I know Carl and I both got ours the same day and he did get sick a little bit. So uh, I was worried about it because we played our first gigs uh, the other night in almost a year. And, right. Uh, uh, I mean, both of us, I mean, we hadn't been on that stage in over a year. And so, yeah, let, let's let's talk a little bit about it. I mean, for me, it was obviously very emotional to be back with colleagues, uh, even in a you know, kind of a separated uh, situation. You, know, you couldn't be close and, and give each other a hug like you usually do. And, you know, there's certain entrance and no mingling and all this stuff. And for winds and brass, I'm sure it's even, even more so the case. Well, we were, uh, you'll all see it from the video eventually, but we were in little plastic boxes, all of us, every one of us. And we were playing against Plastic, which is a terrible way to play a brass instrument. It comes back at you with a terrible sound. Couldn't hear each other. I hope they got good takes from it, but uh, it was no fun. It was. I mean, I. I, I mean, I, I'm happy we did it. Don't get me wrong, but it was it was kind of nerve wracking. One of the pieces was very sensitive, and for a brass player, when it's real sensitive, you got to be. You know, it's easy to chip a note or do something. You know that. I, I think they got between the two takes. I think they got something really good, though. Yeah, and I, I totally agree with you. I'm, I'm I'm grateful that we could have a chance to be back on stage, but it was very difficult to play with the mask on. Um, my whole life, I'm I'm taught to breathe when I play, but you know you have something uh, stopping you from breathing. And the way that I play and the way that Carl conducts, it's you know it's very active and very physical. So I was sweating. My my. My my glasses got fogged up, so I actually had to take my glasses off uh, yeah, for the recording. Uh, me too. And it, it was it was very difficult. And like like you said, I hope I hope we 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 got some good takes and and uh, the results were good. But it was it's something that we need to get used to for the next little bit, and uh, hopefully it'll get easier going forward. Yeah, we'll all cope with it. You know, I mean, it's it's a little scary to play, at least for a brass player, because to stay in shape. It's very hard if you don't play with other musicians. You have to play off of things. You have to respond rather. And so, you know, I've been playing, practicing, and doing things all year, but uh, it's still different getting with real people in a real, a real acoustical environment like we have. Right. I mean, I, I don't know about you guys, but for us, we're also trained to play close, uh, physically close together so we can see, so that we can breathe and we can uh, feel the music together. And right now we're all distanced out and you know not trying to be close and, and trying to be uh, socially distanced while being able to play. So it's a little bit, uh, it's kind of the opposite of what we were trained to do. Exactly. Well, at least we didn't have to wear masks, but we were surrounded by plastic, each, every one of us, and it's at least six feet apart. And it was, and it's just unreal. That's all. I don't know how Carl pulled it together, but I think he did. <laughs> no, yeah, and 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 we played one part of the concert, but you know, Carl did all three winds and brass, winds, yeah. brass, and strings, and and the way he conducts, even without the mask, you know, he sweats a lot, and you know, when you give him a hug after the concert, you know, his his yeah. is drenched. But I can imagine with the mask on. How much more difficult it is for him so uh it's uh it's it's amazing and like like you said you know i'm, I'm glad we're doing it i'm glad i'm grateful that we have a chance to do this but it's 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 it was a difficult week for sure um robert says was it norman hersberg on contrabassoon that's right norman hersberg yes so, was busy thank you for that um uh one question have you ever performed that live as a quartet oh no no in fact <laughs> In fact, you see, I have the music here at home. I've had it since the day I, I, I took it and copied it right away. And uh, it's, you have to realize that it was, it was sort of done, it was changed. You know, you, 
John would do things or he edited things. There's a section in there where it's real high and fast. But it didn't it did it you. Well, that's a, that's the same four players, except it, they put us on a, what was called a harmonizer and it took us up an octave twice as fast. So mm. we didn't play that fast. We didn't play I see. we played an octave lower half as fast. And then they doubled it up and then we overdubbed the pedal tone underneath it. Boom, 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 like that. And uh, that's very hard. You, you couldn't uh, uh, really play that live. The orchestras that have done it like on, you know, concert versions of the, of the movie, if they actually do that section, they, they have a, just a synthesizer player making up everything. I Rather see. That it, it, it would be very hard to, it would be possible to play it live. Are you, are you allowed to tell these kind of secrets on, online? Huh? Are you allowed to tell these kind of secrets to the public? My gosh. Yeah, I'm telling all the secrets. Absolutely. <laughs> You're going to say that you played it all in tempo at the right octave? Come on. That's what, the, that's what everyone's expecting. <laughs> Listen. Yeah, no, I didn't. Well, anyway, I know I'm being very honest about it, of course. Why not? Uh, so I, I think we have a tuba player. It's a very specific question, but uh, and I don't really understand it, but I'm sure you can. How can we? How, how can one work on developing a pedal range that is nimble and responsive? A, a what? A what kind of? A pedal range that is nimble and responsive. Oh man, that's hard on a tuba. <laughs> it's really down there, you know, almost off the piano, and some of the notes are off the piano. Uh, I, of all things, this must be a tuba player, huh? Absolutely. Okay, I uh, the way I learned to play pedal tones was uh, you wouldn't believe it, but I I actually here's my mouthpiece. Okay, I actually I took my whole lower lip and I only I took my whole upper lip and outside the mouthpiece, and I guess I guess got so I could could get a pedal tone to come out with one one lip vibrating. And then later on, I some guys do it just the opposite, all upper lip. And later on, I got pretty good at keeping both lips in there, a little more control. But anyway, that, that's real inside kind of a question, man. Right. Uh, it's definitely from a tuba player. Uh, <laughs> I guess this is, a, this is a question for both of us. Despite being socially distanced, what do you do to sound together and not sound socially distanced? I'm sorry, repeat that, I'm sorry. So despite being socially distanced, what do you do to sound together and not sound socially distanced? You mean when? You mean like in, in the in the session the other night or what? No, 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 yeah, exactly. In, in our rehearsals for Pacific. Um, I heard that, I mean, Carl was talking about it a little bit, but did you guys have something in your ear to try to help you? Yeah, uh, we had we had a a, uh, a a little, not a click, but we had a, we had a sound file going on of the other instruments. It didn't help at all, not for, <laughs> me. not for me, because number one, I couldn't hear myself as, even as bad as it sounded in that booth. Mm. And it was, uh, uh, it was, uh, uh, it was not, it was not fun. Okay. So I, after an actual performance, I didn't wear it. I did it a little bit in the rehearsal, but the drums were so loud in there. Mm. And I know they weren't playing too loud. It's just, that's the way it mm. came through, you know? Right. By the no, way, and for the standing behind me here is, is my wife, Jamie, who is, she said, Hi. well, hello. You know, yeah. I can't see myself, but I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't get in somehow. Okay, well, you can pull up a chair and listen if you want. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so to answer that question of the strings, we didn't have anything in our ear, um, but we have obviously our music director on the podium. And so we're rehearsing, it's just distance. So it's a little bit easier for us because we don't have the plexiglass. We don't have any of these barriers and that's why we're in masks. But um, yeah, I, I can imagine as a wind player uh, in a little box, a plexiglass box, how difficult it could be. Um, it's not a click track, but uh, yeah, I heard there was something in your ear to, to help. And uh, yeah, Jim said it was, it was, <laughs> didn't, didn't help at all. Well, looking around at the other players, most I could see because I was on the one end of the, of the band. Uh, they, uh, they had, uh, 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 I don't think hardly any of them wore that during the actual recording. I see. I'm not sure why, but for me, it was just too loud and, and I, I couldn't hear myself with one ear plugged up. 
Right. No, I mean, uh, for me, uh, all these orchestras for our safety, we, uh, you know, a lot of musicians play with earplugs. But for me, even, uh, you know, pops concerts or rock concerts, I can't play with earplugs in because I just can't hear my own sound. Yeah, so it's very hear. difficult. I can't. Right? So um, maybe one day, you know, I'll go deaf, but uh, I'd rather go deaf one day than not be able to play correctly now. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so uh, I know that you're you're a big teacher and you've taught a lot of the tuba players of the next generation. Uh, first of all, tell us a little about your about your teaching career. You started out in Tennessee, but where else have you taught? Well, uh, I, when I first came to LA, I taught at Cal State Fullerton. I taught Cal State Long Beach, Cal State uh, LA, Cal State Northridge, and a couple junior colleges. Uh, one time, I think I was teaching at six different places of, you know, just part time at every one, including mm -hmm. USC. When I finished my doctorate in 76, they actually hired me as the second tuba teacher and to teach chamber music. And I've been there ever since. Wow. And, and eventually I, I resigned all those other jobs because they, number one, they, they, they didn't pay me very well. And they, it wasn't, it was pretty prestigious, I don't think. And, uh, and uh, just what's going on? Nothing, I'm just gonna lower this volume, okay. All right, sorry. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, anyway, I've taught, I, I gradually get, quit each one and eventually just stayed at USC. And that's where I've been for many years. I see. And uh, I'm sure a lot of people come to you to, to study excerpts was, uh, or do teach all ages of tuba. I only teach college students and I am, I'm, a, I'm the luckiest guy in the world for the fact that I don't have, I, I'm really no good at teaching young people. I learned, <laughs> I learned the hard way. I don't, I don't have patience with them. And uh, I have certain ways I like to teach that are, that are very, uh, uh, just, just one second. Jamie, I can hear all that. Please. Oh, okay. I'll turn it off. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. No problem. And uh, we have uh, so so. And of course, USC is one of the best music schools in the country, and we get very good students. Right. And uh, they're a joy to work with. It's a small small class of six of us, and Doug Tornquist and I both teach there now, and uh, so they get. Six, six students get two teachers and, and wow. we're not like the violin world by the way a kid will come to SC and say I'm going to study with so and so and they spend four years with one teacher right and the, and the teachers demand that I think but uh we we insist they study with both of us yeah no a lot of violin teachers they don't like to share and they, they like to they keep their own but uh I can imagine it's a little bit different in the tube world and uh and so, do you have any uh, graduates uh, who are in professional orchestras today? Well, he's not my secret student, but Gene Picorni is the uh, principal of the uh, Chicago Symphony. He's a graduate of USC. Wow. He was actually a student when I was doing my doctorate there, too. Uh, I've known him forever. And I've actually played with him in Chicago one time for a week uh, mm -hmm. with the uh, Symphony Fantastic. And uh, he wasn't my student, but uh, he was there the last year or two of uh, when I was doing my doctorate. And uh, anyway, uh, I've got uh, teachers at colleges around the country. Uh, I'm, I uh, don't know if I have any uh, people that are in major orchestras as, that were my particular students. Mm -hmm. See, I taught at USC for 30 years with Tommy Johnson. My, my mm -hmm. mentor and teacher. And uh, we sh shared the class for all those years. And then later on, uh, Norm Pearson from the LA Phil came in. Tommy died uh, 16 years ago, young, unfortunately. But, uh, and then now Doug and I. So we've always had two tuba teachers since I've been there. Amazing. Um, uh, I, I saw a, a whole list of clips. Uh, can you set up the next clip for Alexi to share? Oh yeah, you mean? Oh, which one were you gonna? You have an order you're gonna do or what? No, there's. I mean, everything that you sent, he has. So if you just talk about one, he'll he'll upload it. Well, if you want to hear something classical, play the syrinx, which is a flute solo by Debussy. Absolutely. 
And when you think of, of tuba, you don't think of a classical instrument, but this is a beautiful piece. Wow, sounds like a real instrument. It sounds like a solo instrument. You rarely hear that, obviously. Well, I've had I've had quite a few people tell me they like it better on tuba than flute. Even oh, though, awesome! Even though it's two octaves lower. <laughs> no, but it's it's it's. I mean, it's you're a real virtuoso. It's, it's beautiful. Um, we have a question from one of our biggest fans, Rosalind. Um, I heard you play a tuba concerto commissioned for you several years ago when I was a new subscriber. Might you play that concerto again sometime when we are back to normal? You mean with the Pacific Symphony? Yeah. The only thing I ever played at uh, was the third movement of the of the John Williams tuba concerto, oh, which is wow. an incredibly difficult piece, and John conducting it. We did a concert uh, in the old hall. I think it was the twenty fifth anniversary of the symphony or something and John mm -hmm. and Carl shared the stage the whole night they kept going back and forth between pieces that Carl would conduct and John would conduct and uh, four of the principal players got to play you know like I think uh, our concert master played uh, a little bit of uh, I don't know a brook or something like that and then I played uh, that and, and the clarinet player did Mozart clarinet you know movement Mm -hmm. So that's the only time I've ever played. I played some other things with the Pops Orchestra before, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so to answer that, I'm sure it's possible that in the future when we're all back and playing big orchestra stuff again, that uh, you could be a soloist. Well, uh, we have a question from I have, Dan. I have, I have a plan. I'm not going to talk about it, but I do have a plan to have a, a, a hope, hopefully a new concerto. Oh, awesome. If, if maybe we'll get to do it. But I want to talk about it. <laughs> um, so Denise has a question. Uh, are the scores typically recorded after shooting is complete? 
And if so, do the musicians get to screen the movie before performing? They are, yes, the music is, is just post-production, they call it. And uh, lots of things are put on in post-production, including sound effects and train whistles and dog barks and uh, Dixieland bands and everything else you can imagine. And uh, uh, that's, that's, and no, we do not see it ahead of time. And only recently have they even been able to see any of the music ahead of time. Right. And, uh, yeah, and I, I've, I've had some scary stories on that one too, because <laughs> you come in in the morning and I remember doing a John Williams call on the movie Hook. And uh, it was, I saw the music in the morning. It wasn't much there. It looked like it was for every day, all day. And we went out to lunch with the trombones and me and uh, came back and there was a new cue on the stand. And, and I had no time to look at it really. And uh, certainly you don't warm up on stage in front of your colleagues. They hate that, you know, that's insulting to have you <laughs> doing this. So he called it up first in the afternoon. And I had, and it was 40 bars of strings and stuff. And then a tuba solo about eight or 10 bars long. That was uh, very chromatic and up high. And uh, I don't know, I pulled it off. That's one of those lucky stories again. I've had uh, quite a few moments in my studio career when I didn't think I had to, had it to pull it off, but I did. If I didn't pull it off, that may have been my last job, you know? <laughs> That's true. Um, so I, I'm, a, I'm a pretty good sight reader, but when you get to the sessions, you realize that everyone there is an incredible sight reader. Uh, like you said, a lot of times we get the music day of, and sometimes they're writing it as we're playing. So uh, no time to practice, no time to rehearse. And in the studios, I mean, I've, I only have two years experience to your tier 50, but uh, there's so many unwritten rules like warming up before playing loud. All these things are, are, are uh, a faux pas. So uh, like you said, there's, it's a really different uh, you know, vibe uh, in the studios compared to, you know, let's say the Pacific Symphony where you go out on stage and you warm up, that's fine. No one's going to say anything. But uh, in the studios, everything seems to be a little bit different. And I can imagine you have a thousand stories uh, in, your, in your 40 years. I've had a lot of them. And uh, of course, not just about me, but other players, you know, and, and their, their challenges that way too. I guess I'm a pretty good sight reader, although uh, I, my secret is, is taking care of rhythm. Rhythm is my whole thing. It's, it's the number one thing in music, I think, the most important thing in music. And mm -hmm. I focus on that. And one of my, my, I think my success as a player is that I know how to play with other musicians. If, you, if we have a, we have a, uh, we're doing a samba, I know how to make a samba feel right on a tuba. Right. Most <laughs> players don't have a clue about that stuff because they're classically trained, you know, and mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't play with their ears, but I do play with my ears. So, so how did you get started on the tuba? It seems like you have a rock background and a jazz background. You've got a lot of stuff. Uh, so you, I, I guess you didn't start on the tuba. I started on the guitar, believe it or not. And I let it go for, I was a bad guitar player. So a lot of, later on, I became a bass player and played jazz and stuff like that. But I became a tuba player in junior high school because they needed a tuba in the band. And I went to college to be a teacher and, you know, it was the best thing I did. I got in this old state band when I was in high school and stuff like that. So uh, in Pennsylvania, and uh, it just led one thing to a letter. I just thought I didn't think I'd make a career of playing until I got in the U.S. Army band in Washington, which was Vietnam War time, by the way, which is if I wasn't there, I'd have been drafted into the war. And uh, so I think it was one of the big, the first big break I had in my life, I think was that. No, and, and there's a guitar in the background right now. Uh, tell me what you've been doing during uh, the Corona quarantine. Oh, well, I've been, I've been taking rock and roll guitar lessons with, right. I have a famous guitar player, Steve Fister lives here on my street. And we take, I take Zoom lessons with him and I'm, I'm having a total ball with it. <laughs> And you know I'm into improvisation. That's a big deal for me. My and my jazz playing, and I, and I'm I've got many albums, by the way, jazz albums and classical albums. But I'm really into that. I'm and that's a big part of my life is to become a better improviser. It's a lifetime project, in fact. Right. Uh, it's almost been a year since I've seen you. What's going on with the hair? What's going on, Jim? What's going on what? 
What's going on with your hair? Oh, well, I used to be a hippie, you know, like most of the <laughs> back in those days with bell-bottom pants and stuff. Uh, I decided since it wasn't safe to go to a barber, I just I'm let my hair grow for this whole year just to prove I still have hair left. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I wasn't going to get it cut until they I had my my shots and stuff. And I got my second one the other day, and I'm going to get a haircut pretty soon. It's a kind of a drag taking care of it. No, but that's a pretty pretty awesome mustache. I wish I had that skill. <laughs> well, I walked by Carl's Carl's office after the rehearsal the other night. He says, he "says Jim, you never look like you're getting old." He says, "I like your hairdo." <laughs> Well, that's a nice compliment. <laughs> I am get pretty old, though. <laughs> um, so, so many people are asking. I mean, you've done. I mean, so many scores. Do you have one particular favorite score that you played or been a part of? Well, it's hard. Again, it's hard to say. I said you look at those three hundred, but but uh, Close Encounters is a standout one, of course. But uh, uh, many with James Horner. But batteries not included was one. Uh, many other John Williams films, uh, uh, Jurassic Park. I did a great film with uh, Horner called Rocketeer, uh, and many, many other. I did was with him for 28 years, and many, many extremely challenging tuba solos, up super high, up doubled with the violas and stuff like that. Hard, scary brass stuff, and. Uh, and I've at Home Alone movies, of course, both of the one and two have a pack full of solos. Mm -hmm. There's a movie by Jerry Goldsmith uh, did of uh, Dennis the Menace with Walter Matthau, pack full of tuba solos. Absolutely. And those those are standouts for me, you mm -hmm. know. But there's it's too many to 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 say, you know. Yeah, I I hope that uh, I have the same stories as you because for me right now, you know, I've been part of a, a few and uh, you especially were? for my fit especially for my family and my family in Korea, you know, they, they know that I've had different jobs and been costume master in different places. And this, this summer when I went back, they were like, wait, you're on Star Wars? Yeah, wow, you must be really good. <laughs> yeah, they didn't think that before and all the other great jobs you had. <laughs> I know it's exactly what you mean. It happens to me all the time too. Yeah, no. um, so, so we have a question from, um, from Gardy Good. I don't know if that's Gary Good, but um Gary, sure. I, I don't know if it's Gary, it's spelled Garty, so maybe it's I don't know. But who are some of your favorite tuba players? Is the question. Well, when the two guys I studied with, my major teachers were Harvey Phillips in New York City and uh Tommy Johnson here in Los Angeles. They were the greatest players of their time, along with Arnold Jacobs, who was the principal tuba of the Chicago Symphony for many years. Sure. Uh, those and Roger Bobo, who was here in Los Angeles, they, those were all big, strong influences on me. And there are some other great young players out there that I've influenced and written, composed music for them. Even uh, a guy named Sergio Carolino from Portugal, he's, he's scary what he can do on the tuba. And there are some other guys too. I mean, the world is full of good tuba players now, thanks to Americans, by the way, because we went mm -hmm. all over the world and taught them how to play. Right. And now they're better than us. Right. And the typical tuba player looks a little different now. I know the Philadelphia Orchestra has a, has a young lady who's a tuba player. Yep. Um, stereotypically, you know, you think of the very large, heavy uh, set, you know, guy in the back playing tuba, but that's not the case. I mean, even your CD, you look really uh, trim and fit. Um, so are those all just myths that you have, you have to be big and heavy to, to have a big sound? Oh yeah, that's a myth. I, 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 there are some small men. There are, you know, there are certainly some several women now, and uh, they're very good. And uh, that's that is a myth. And uh, oh. although it, 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 we we are identified with big things like elephants and and uh, <laughs> Klingons and, uh, <laughs> and and other other uh, large things, you know, when we have solos in the movie, it's often. Uh, it's often a, uh, it's rarely a love song. I had a love song in Sleepless in Seattle, but most of the time it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, you're, it's comedy, you know. Right. Um, so yeah, um, of course, because of who you are, there's so many questions about the sessions, but uh, so another one is, um, so you, you don't get the music beforehand. Would it help your performance if you did? 
Uh, and I'm not a musician, so perhaps you have all the information you need from the notes on the page. So, I mean, to, to answer that from my point of view, yeah, it doesn't matter what the movie is, doesn't matter what's going on on stage. We have all the information on the page that we need. Um, you, and, don't, you don't get tired. You don't, you don't get paid for practicing your music. All right. So <laughs> I'd rather not see it, to be honest, except occasionally maybe a solo. But uh, if it's really, you know, and of course, I'm not a young guy anymore. And, I'm, you know, I, I don't but I'm not very busy in the studios anymore either. So I don't I don't expect I don't want the heat. I don't want the heat of a difficult solo. Uh, because I don't want to be embarrassed for making a mistake or something, you know, and and uh, so I'll let Doug do it and my other, you know, the other young people, it's their turn. Right. Um, so uh, I guess Gary's asking about the composition. Did you write a concerto grosso for the Pacific Symphony? I wrote a piece, it's not quite a concerto grosso, but it's a little bit like a concerto for orchestra, like Bartok in a sense, in a, in a sense that it features a lot of the so, the principal players. Wow. wow. A, a, a nice, beautiful violin solo, a couple of them for the concertmaster. And uh, it's, it's called, it's called, uh, uh, it's called Tour de Force. And wow. it's, it's kind of nine episodes all put into one 14 minute piece and Carl premiered it. And we did it uh, on four concerts, and uh, I think it's for sale now on the Insta, Insta, whatever the you know the, the way you can buy stuff from the Pacific Symphony. Wow, amazing! So, do, do you well. have formal training in composition, or is this something that you just do? I didn't start composing until I was almost fifty years old, and now I have about eighty titles, including an orchestra piece, a couple band pieces, and lots of chamber music. Wow, amazing! Yeah. And in fact, one of the things, one of the clips you have there, I did a, I've written eight brass quintets and I recorded them all with Los, with the best classical players around LA about three years ago. And uh, there's a piece called Polarities that opens the album is two antiphonal brass quintets. It was recorded at Meng Hall at Cal State Fullerton by Pacific Symphony brass players, all of them. Awesome, I'm sure Alexi has that and that would be amazing to listen to. Thank you. 
gosh, that sounds amazing. Is that Barry on top? That's Barry on top, absolutely. Oh my goodness. Well, um, the, last, the last note was played by Rob Freer, who was a frequent principal sub in the orchestra. Wow. High, oh. A super high note. Yeah. Um, so, so during these times where we can't have a big orchestra play, we should do some of your chamber music. It sounds amazing. Well, tell Carl that, please. <laughs> so do you write only for brass or do you have all different kinds of compositions? I have, a, I have a, a, a string quartet. I have a piece for all kinds of things. It's not very long pieces, you know, mostly five minutes or so. I've got woodwind quintet. I've got a lot of brass chamber music, larger pieces. And wow. So we, we, got, we have to have an evening of Jim Self's music. Maybe a, a Guardy Good can uh, get the funding for that. Uh, I'm joking, Gary, of course. Uh, so uh, that's a, uh, if you can get the funding for it, Gary, we'll, we'll do a piece of all of Jim's music in a concert. That sounds like a plan. I did want to show you this, which Gary <laughs> got a copy of this. This is my newest CD. It just came uh -huh. out. It's a triple jazz CD by David Angel Band. It's called Out on the Coast. Can you read that? Yeah. And it's uh, uh, Gary bought one, and so did uh, John Forsythe. So uh, it's a really a cool product. It's available on jimself.com, my website. And, awesome. Uh, and it's the most amazing musicians in Los Angeles, jazz musicians. I play in the band too, but I produced it. I'm very wow. proud. It's been the project of my life. Well, incredible. Yep. Um, so, I mean, th there's a question. Are, are you more comfortable playing jazz or classical music? I, I don't have a one, one or the other. Uh, mm -hmm. Jazz is more challenging in many ways, but mm -hmm. classical is more challenging in other ways. You know what I mean? Like, because my whole thing is to become a better improviser, to be, I, my, my, my happiest moments in life are when I am in the moment. And what I mean being in the moment, it's true in a concert too, and, but in a moment means improvising and not thinking about it. Just me and, you know, in, in the world or God or whatever, you know, it's me and, 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 and the cosmos. And I just feel that that's the happiest moments of my life. Yeah, no, it's, it's really fascinating to get, get to know you better. And, uh, you know, if it wasn't Corona, actually, you know, this is kind of a difficult situation, you know, to, to pick a colleague's brain. You know, the, the only time I, I actually have really spoken to you is during the Nutcracker when we're getting changed. And usually both of us are so tired, you know, playing two Nutcrackers in a, in a weekend. But you're always so funny and, you know, you've got a dry wit and you're always, you know, uh, you always seem so caring and, and you're a great colleague to have. So it was, it was great to get to finally know you better and to, to see you as a teacher and a, and a composer. I, I had no idea. I learned a lot today. Well. I, I, I'm, I call myself a musicolic because mm -hmm. it's what I do. I live almost entirely, my life is almost music, composing, writing, improvising, uh, playing concerts, playing four orchestras, not just Pacific, by the way. And I play the LA Opera and the Pasadena and the, uh, and the uh, Hollywood Bowl Orchestra. So I'm, I'm usually busy as heck, you know, I'm just, going from one thing to the next and uh, this year has been different of course but but uh but it's uh my whole pretty much my whole life has been that way and i'm i'm hooked on it i am i'm passionate about music mm -hmm. no and it's I'm amazing about, you know, my favorite orchestra piece is the bartok concerto sure. uh, and i i it's, it's not because there's no major tuba solos or anything in it but it's because it's an incredibly Compos incredible composition in its efficiency. Anyway, mm. yeah. No, no, it's it's uh, I, no, it's one of my favorite pieces. Also, somebody asks, how do you keep track of you know all the schedule playing in so many different orchestras? Well, it's not easy, and mm -hmm. luckily, uh, I'm a, you know uh, the, the the business in Los Angeles is very much a freelance business, and just about everybody is like this. They play in more than one group. And uh, being a tuba player, I'm not needed all the time at Pacific or at the LA Opera. Uh, maybe half the operas have a tuba part even, you know. And uh, so I'm able, and every orchestra has an excused absence policy, which allows me to take off so much, so many services a year or concerts. And, and there recently, be, I've been, I don't know how I've done it, but I've done it for 40 years now. And uh, uh, 
I keep keep going at it. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, it is kind of complex though, I must say. I, you know, I, try, to make, I try to make musical choices. Mm -hmm. It's a great orchestra piece or it's a great opera or it's a great uh, uh, movie score or something. You know, I try to, I try to make uh, those choices if I, if I can, but sometimes. Absolutely. I, sometimes. Oh, yeah, it's, it's a total, totally different situation out here because in the East Coast, you know, everyone has their main job and that's what they do. But like you say, a lot of our members, you know, they do a bunch of different things. Um, uh, we, we have people playing the studios in the Pacific Symphony and then they teach. And we have some members of the orchestra who actually have totally different uh, careers. Like Bob Voss, he's in our cello section. He's a professor yeah. at USC teaching something, nothing to do with music. So it's, it's an incredible group of musicians. Right. And uh, it's unique to Los Angeles. And, uh, my dreams of coming here when I was a boy. I just wanted to come to California, get out of the cold weather and the humid weather, and it all worked out for me. So excellent! No, we're we're lucky to have you, and uh, congratulations on your vaccination. And hopefully, we'll be back on stage with no plexiglass soon. Um, it was a real pleasure uh, speaking to you, and uh, I, I'm sure all of our our listeners uh, learned a lot today and and got a chance to get to know you a little bit better. Um, stay well, um, and I, like I said, I hope to see you very soon on stage and to give you an actual handshake, not a, a, a fist pump, um, and, uh, and good health, and please take care until the next time I see you. I just want to thank you. You do this very well, Dennis, thank and, you. Uh, and uh, for such a young man. <laughs> and, uh, no, I'm not so young anymore, but uh, it's. And I love playing with the orchestra and with Carl and with all my colleagues. It's uh, it's a very important part of my life, and hope I can do it a few more years. We'll see. No, it's great. I, I mean, I think today has been the most honest mixer that anyone will ever expect. I mean, you said some stuff that I that you, you're taking them behind the curtain. You gotta be careful. <laughs> no, but it's great that uh, you no, know, you're at the point in your life in your career where yeah, you can say whatever you want. Honesty is the best policy, so it's great. And I, I hope our listeners enjoyed it because some of those things that you said today, those are top top secrets, and uh, it's uh, it's it's amazing uh, stuff that you've gained from many many years of experience. So it's uh, it was really uh, fascinating and, and, and interesting speaking to you today. Uh, next week we have four living composers joining us. Um, they might be composers that uh, we're not familiar with here in the West Coast, but uh, I promise you they are uh, interesting. Maybe not as interesting as Jim, but uh, they're incredible uh, composers and and musicians. And I hope you can all join. It'll be next Wednesday at our normal time at 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Jim, and thank you all for. Uh, for listening, and we hope to see you all on stage soon. Can I say uh, one last thing? Please. I know there are probably a bunch of patrons listening, and uh, I, I want to thank you on behalf of the musicians for your support and for your financial support and for your coming to our concerts and your helping us get through this tough year. And uh, it's very, very important that you are we're partners in all of this. I'm not, I'm not a musician unless I have an audience. Amen. Absolutely. I, I agree with you 100%. We thank everyone in the community, uh, not only for your financial support, but for all your support, you know, for you watching our, our mixers, staying connected with the musicians. Because like Jim said, without you guys, you know, we're, we're, we're not musicians. Yeah. And uh, we're grateful to everyone in the Pacific Symphony family. Thanks so much, Jim. It was great talking to you. I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Take care.